privilege and honor, I introduce Georgia Popwell. Thank you, Scott. And thanks for not spilling the beans about my domestic habits. Um, I have slides. May I get my slides? Or, or do I? All right. That actually is my, um, my little um, bit of Occupy Wall Street internal activism. Uh, comment on the fact that uh, it's Rhea and I are the only women in the program. And it's a good thing that Mr. Minchil didn't come up because we would have been actually a lot fewer. So that, that should read, we are the 22%. Rhea, thanks for being here as well. Um, how many of you recognize that thing on the screen? Great. For those of you who don't, which means that you were probably under a rock um, two weeks ago, that is the hashtag that was used to propel Anya Ayong Chi, our compatriot who won Project Runway recently, to the fan favorite award on Twitter. It was an amazing campaign um, in which Trinidadians and other people in the Caribbean you know, stayed up late at night and monitored the, the stats um, to make sure that, that, that Anya won this award. And um, as a result, she's also donating the money to a micro fund, which is great. And uh, on Facebook afterwards, which of course is where everything in Trinidad and Tobago gets said, a number of people were wondering how this incredible energy could be harnessed to kind of drive, in, in other spheres, to drive positive change. But the thing is that it's not quite as simple as that. There are certain things and events that are just more attention grabbing than others. Project One is a reality TV series, Anya was very easy to root for, and the, the kind of barriers to entry for the PR Anya thing were actually pretty minimal. All you had to do was create a tweet, a post on Twitter, not saying anything, and tack that on. And set your computer and go bam. It was done. Um, so as I was saying before, that's, that's kind of how it is, that there's certain things that are just more attention grabbing than others. In the, this, the news um, scheme, we have natural disasters, for instance. Although in the realm of natural disasters, earthquakes and tsunamis outdo floods and famines for some reason. I guess they're just more dramatic. Um, revolutions do well, but they do well during the period when people are still in the streets during the, the, the build-up period afterwards, as we're seeing in Tunisia and Egypt, the, you know, the news isn't as, as dramatic as before and not being as much covered by the US media, for instance. But that's, that's kind of how it is. But that's also one of the questions that the organization I'm representing here today, Global Voices, has been grappling with for the six years of its existence. How do you help people pay attention to information that's not immediately sexy or popular or familiar, more importantly. How do you get people to pay attention to countries they don't know very well? But flashback to 2005. I'm starting a blog and a podcast. It's called Caribbean Free Radio. And I did it for a few reasons. I did it because I could. The World Wide Web and internet technology had evolved by that point um, to, to a place where it was not only possible but also relatively easy to do such things. I did it because it gave me an opportunity to write about things I cared about that other people might not care to publish. I got to learn about the internet, the web, sound, and I also did it because, that's my logo, if you went on Google and put the word Caribbean in, that's what you saw. Maps. See, sun, actually very few people. I think the only person is a tourist. It's the first page of Google. So I also did it to diversify the archive of, of content about the Caribbean that exists online. On that podcast, I did things um, like an audio tour of Port of Spain after the April 2005 earthquake with my friend Mark Franco, who's here in the audience. That's actually his favorite show, somehow. I did um, uh, conversations with writers and artists. I did. This, this is my, my effort to try to get some of Wendell's mojo. I did a series of, of shows on Carnival of Three Canal in addition to a lot of other shows with them. At that time, in 2005, there were a handful of us blogging in Trinidad and Tobago. Some of them are in this room, probably. Jacqueline Morris was blogging at the time, Nicholas Lachlan, if he's here. Um, 
not many in Trinidad and Tobago, not many in the Caribbean, but this was in fact a global movement. People throughout the world were putting their, their stories online. And um, they were doing it for reasons perhaps similar to mine, but some people were also doing it for slightly more urgent reasons. They were telling their stories because Number one, um, there might have been local personal stories that the media wasn't interested in. They're also telling their stories because they're, they're countries in the world where you just can't say certain things. Freedom of expression was an issue. In China, for instance, there are things you can't say online. So, given this burgeoning of, of online content, they, there was actually kind of quite a bit of stuff that was, that was decent. A lot of it was not great, of course. But um, among it, there was a lot of good stuff. And what was also great about it was these stories were being told by people who lived in the places they were writing about. These weren't journalists who were being parachuted in. So there was a kind of unique perspective you were getting, a local flavor, a sense of place. And um, around 2004, my, that's my censorship slide that I kind of went up. Around 2004, two researchers at Harvard University's Berkman Center which is a center at Harvard that studies the internet, started thinking about, given the omissions and deficiencies uh, of international media coverage as regards countries that aren't in North America, Western Europe, how could they use this burgeoning um, online kind of movement, this massive content, how could they harness it to, to extract value from it, to filter it, to make sense of it, and in that way amplify these voices and give a fuller picture of the countries they were talking about. How, for instance, could Americans, I mean, they were Americans, of course, access what people in Trinidad were saying, especially if the Trinidadians were writing in dialect? How could they access what Saudis were saying if the Saudis were writing in, um, in Arabic? So the, the result of that effort was Global Voices. It was founded in 2005 at Harvard, and um, we actually, in 2008, we became an independent NGO. I like to say that Global Voices was developed to solve a number of key problems. First of them was, there's so much content. And how do we know what's good and reliable? I mean, blogs are, are notorious for um, kind of being accused of being kind of not very reliable sources of information. Who knows what that says? All right. English isn't the only language on the internet. Some of the content that, that, that might be actually really good may not exist in the language that we speak here. The online space is not accessible to everyone. There's still people who can't get online for various reasons. Access because they don't have electricity, access because they're too poor, access because they, they don't know how. And then there are forces who would like to stop people from expressing themselves online. And these forces aren't just in the obvious places. No, it's just not Iran and China. There are kind of movements throughout the world now. Governments are, are clamping down heavily on, um, on the internet, especially in the wake of the Arab uprisings. How do we do this? How do we deal with the issue of so much content? Basically, this is Global Voices. This is an article in Trinidad and Tobago. I chose that specially. We um, actually cover the entire world. On a given day, our members of our 500 strong community, 94% of whom are volunteers, incidentally, are trolling Twitter, reading blogs, scanning YouTube to find out what people are saying online. And actually, our, our agenda is driven by what people are doing online. Sometimes people come to us and say, why aren't you covering X? I mean, like, nobody's talking about it online. So unless we engineer something, we have nothing to, to amplify, really. And they are then taking that material, shaping it into an article. And in that article, they'll be giving, giving context for the subject. I mean, in, in the case of Trinidad and Tobago, I mean, where's that for most of our readers? You know, there's an opening paragraph. There are links to things. And then there's a, a list of um, uh, excerpts of, of social media that mention the state of emergency. So it's all kind of packaged into a nice article. Then there's another step that deals with this issue. That's the article in Chinese. So when this was published, people in China were able to, to read about the state of emergency. That wasn't true of the, the article in Express, for instance. It was also translated into Spanish. 
later on it may be translated into any of the 19 other languages you translate into, which include things like Malagasy and Aymara and Swahili and Macedonian. This is the, um, one of the articles about Anya in Russia. So Russians were able to read about that, that issue. We, are, we have another section um, that solves this problem or attempts to. It's co hmm. I missed the slide, sorry. That's called Rising Voices. And um, what Rising Voices does is it's a network for people who are seeking to develop projects to bring their communities online. We give small micro grants. We've done about 30 of them. Um, we've funded projects in Mali, Guinea-Bissau, Kenya, India, Jamaica, and um, in the latest group we have projects, um, for instance, there's a group of visually impaired people in Greece who are using the internet. They lost funding because of you know, the economic crisis, so they're now trying to do a lot of things themselves using the internet. Um, we have a project currently, a group of fishermen in Chennai, India, who are mapping their community online. So. Then we have Global Voices Advocacy, our um, section dealing with freedom of expression online. And that section uh, reports on attacks on freedom of expression, it, it reports on um, the activities of internet governance, um, activities like the recent ICANN meetings, we had some nice articles about that, and um, policy as well. Where, um, where do we do this and how do we do this? This is an organizational chart. It's actually a lot flatter than it looks. And that's how we do it. We actually have no office. We are registered in the Netherlands, but we're all over the world. I work from home. I actually run a Netherlands nonprofit from my home in Trinidad, and that's all thanks to the internet. Um, some of our community. The 2011 has been a, a huge year for us, largely thanks to the Arab uprising, and um, which for us, and I think for the rest of the world, validated the power of, of social and citizen media to be used as part of a social change agenda. I think um, everybody must have read at least one or two articles that call these things the Twitter revolution or Facebook revolution, which actually isn't very accurate, but it is very true that, that these services such as Twitter and Facebook and YouTube and Daily Motion played a part in both helping people report on the events and also to organize. And I think without those, those tools, our own experience of, of those events would have been very, very different. We actually would, have, would not have known a lot of what was going on if people like Al Jazeera hadn't kind of been working directly with Tunisians or um, Egyptians or the other bigger mainstream media kind of had been really looking at those very important factors. Um, social media has really become part of the fabric of, of our lives here in Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, Facebook is the, I think we have 422,000 something people on on Facebook in this country, and which is a good percentage of the population. And that's, that's people who identify as Trinidadians as well, so there are probably others. Um, and I, but I think we have yet to explore its potential. And maybe that's because we don't have to. The, the urgency that people in Tunisia and Egypt felt, we're yet to, to feel that, although who knows. And um, I think also we haven't quite figured out how we want to participate as citizens in general, in life, in the political life of this country. But I think there are a lot of things that, that we can learn by, by looking at other countries um, and how they've used technology. I think technology is very situational. It, it varies from context to context. There are places where Facebook will, will, be, will do things that it can't in other countries. There are places where you know, the orchid, Google's very esoteric um, social network is big in Brazil and India, or used to be, and it wasn't anywhere else. But I, I think by looking at what other countries are doing, I, I think we could kind of skip a lot of the mistakes. And also we, we need to look at things like safeguarding our rights and learning about things like internet governance. I'm going to challenge Jacqueline Morris actually to, to do some kind of public stuff about her, her work with ICANN because Jacqueline's very active in, um, in internet governance movements. Because we have seen rumblings this past year um, 
and um, overture was made towards wanting to regulate things. The Granny Keeler incident, for instance. The, um, the astroturfing by um, alleged astroturfing by, by students at UWE, you know, leaving comments on mailing lists and blogs. Those kind of things, that's where it starts. So I think we need to be looking at how to safeguard our rights and how to, to kind of use them responsibly as well. So this is really a little ad for Global Voices and, and, and how great a tool it is for providing all of that in one place. The, um, the URL is globalvoicesonline.org. There's actually a globalvoices.org. We're constantly wrangling with them to try to get the, um, the address, but they won't give it to us. And um, really, I mean, there's content kind of being put there every day. Trinidad and Tobago actually is disproportionately kind of um, represented because we have a Trinidadian Car an editor who is um, responsible for the Caribbean, that's Janine Mens Franco. And um, yeah, I, I really encourage you to, to look at the site, use it, learn from it. And especially um, on Global Voices Advocacy, we've been doing these great, uh, this great series called Netizen Reports, which are roundups of, um, of just kind of netizen rights issues. You know, places where Facebook is being blocked or a policy that, that, that Google has introduced somewhere that we might know about, but actually will affect us in the end. That's it for now. Thank you. The 22% is out of the house. <laughs>